Hey, and welcome again to another episode of Shared Learning. Today, I'm with Lacey Iverson, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the creative process. Lacey is our music specialist in early childhood and primary school. Uh, Lacey, we had a really great conversation about creativity. So I'm interested maybe to start with, what do I walk into your classroom and see as happening as the creative process? It will always be noisy. Okay. <laughs> it will always be noisy um, because the, the material that we work with um, is sound, mm -hmm. right? Um, gosh, you'll see all kinds of things. Um, sometimes we might be moving, like dancing, mm -hmm. moving our bodies a lot because movement is one of the ways that all of the ages that I work with find to connect to music if they can feel a complicated piece in their bodies, they're going to learn how to play it better and be able to play it together. Um, but at the same time, feeling an idea like falling delicately like a leaf, mm -hmm. right, then helps them put how they move their body into words. And then they can show more abstract ideas like that through sound at an instrument when they're composing because we, we compose and we improvise and yeah. Lots of different things. It's really interesting this word you said connect in mm. our conversation before. It was fascinating to me to hear all of the different ways that you connect what your learners are doing in the music classroom with the things that they're doing throughout the school. So I wonder if you can kind of share some light on some of those experiences. Sure. So um, I'll, I'll start by saying that the the philosophy that I follow most in music education um, is based on a philosophy by a man named Carl Orff mm -hmm. and several other uh, of his companions. And one of the most important things that Orff felt about music with children was that children should be their own composers, mm -hmm. that they had the capacity to be their own composers. Um, and I think this fits in really, really well with the way that music education is being taught in much of the world now, the way that our standards have kind of moved from music, which are focused less on individual elements of, of reading and writing music and much more on creating. Mm -hmm. And when kids are creating their own music, the world is open to any topic, right? So. Um, that means that I can focus on some maybe musical element we're trying to learn, like a certain form in music. We're trying to do something in A, 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 B form. What but, is that? Yeah. yeah. So like three times the same and then something different okay. the fourth time. Um, and that, that connects even as low as kindergarten when they're talking about patterns and they come home and they're like, it's an A, B, A, B, A, B pattern mm -hmm. of shapes they're doing. Mm -hmm. They can connect that to sounds and patterns. And so at that age, we already start talking about seeing patterns in music. Um, but then let's say we get older with kids, like right now, uh, third graders are just getting ready to kind of start working on thermal energy transfers, okay. which seems like it has nothing to do with music I wouldn't think at so. all, right? Um, but I got to have an awesome lesson with third graders where we were talking about movement of the different kinds of heat transfers. And so radiation being like waves, mm -hmm. okay. right? Yeah. And conduction needing to touch, things being touching to transfer, and convection being this cycle, like bubbling, boiling, right? Um, changing, trading places. And so it started as sort of a movement lesson where we were really just improvising movement with our bodies. And then once they had done that, they were able to talk more about how they were moving their bodies, why they were making the choices they were, how is this person showing waving differently from this person? Mm -hmm. How could they show waves as an individual, but also show waves as a group, right? So that one person is starting it. How can they show that it's spreading from one spot to another spot. And once they put that into words, the next lesson we took it to xylophones. Mm -hmm. But we talked a little bit before we went, okay, so remember how we said this was all the different ways we could show waves for radiation. How would we do that with sound? Hmm. How does that transfer to sound? How do you make something sound like a wave? So they had to draw from their musical knowledge and think things going up, things going down. 
um, but then not necessarily just on one instrument. How could they show it as a group, right? As an ensemble. And that early kind of stuff is really just improvisation. They're just trying things out. It's just sound. It's just sort of an idea. And then they're going to move from that to choosing like their form, how they want to create melodic patterns that they like at those instruments that are showing that idea of one of the heat transfers and choose a form and, and end up making a final composition. Maybe they'll add accompaniment patterns, something else, but it's a chance for them to solidify those, those like scientific learning that they're having, having <laughs> in class, yeah. um, but also creating something that has its own integrity for music. That seems, I mean, if I'm thinking about it as a teacher, mm. it seems really scary. Okay, let's start with heat transfer and make mm -hmm. some music. So how do you get started with something like that? And, and why are you doing it that way? Uh, well, I've had some really, really fantastic teachers for myself, mm -hmm. right, along the way, um, who have shared ideas of things that have worked for them in their, in their classes. But it just takes a tremendous amount of trust, mm -hmm. not just me trusting the students, but the students trusting me. Yeah and trusting each other and kids being willing to take on the role as creator and that takes some effort, right? Um, but once, anytime that I've given kids that, that power, they always rise to the challenge, right? Uh, kids want to be in control of their learning and they're so much more invested in it when they're helping create that way themselves. Um, and yeah, it is, it, it can be scary, right? Uh, having kids get up to do a performance on stage, like for winter concerts and stuff of things that they've created. There's a lot less in my control as mm -hmm. their teacher than there would be if I just am having them learn to sing a song and they stand up on the stage and they have it memorized and they sing it back, which has value, absolutely. Um, but when less is in my control, my role becomes less that I'm the conductor mm. and more that I'm just there to morally support them. Do you know what's really yeah. interesting, if I can jump in? Sure. When I watched, you shared a clip with me, mm. and when I watched it, it was so fascinating because the students on stage were looking at the other students, the other mm. musicians on stage, and I thought, like, that is such an interesting, I don't know, outcome of what you're doing in the classroom, I suppose, that they kind of look to each other. Yeah, so that's that's really what you would expect from even adult musicians, yeah. right? You go to see a concert, you see musicians looking at each other, communicating with each other, smiling, enjoying, playing, kind of acknowledging, oh, you just took a solo, that was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, because in that little clip, those are second graders improvising. So imagine that being like, that's their guitar solo. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Uh, they were taking their turns, making things up on the spot, creating a little something on the stage in the concert. <laughs> so they had their, their composition, their piece that they had made up together that was based on Northern Lights. Because all I had given them was a topic of light that was kind of related to our overall concert topic. Um, and they had chosen as a class that they were really fascinated in Northern Lights. They had moved to show Northern Lights and things like that. Um, and they then talked about like what sorts of ways they could describe Northern Lights moving. So we watched a little short video clip of fast action Northern Lights and they came out with stuff like ribbons and swirls and rainbows in the sky and stuff like that. So the words that they had come up with, I think I shared with you is something like um, Ribbons in the sky, rainbow swirls that dance and glow, uh, bring the night alive, tell, tell me or show me where your colors go. Okay. <laughs> Something like that. And they had taken those words to xylophones. They had tried them out uh, in different ways till they came up with a melody that they liked to play those words as their rhythm on the xylophone. They all agreed on that, but then yeah, they're improvising in the middle. They're looking at each other. In the end, they created a part that they wanted someone to play, they decided they all had too much that they were wanting to do and asked me to play a part with them. So you see me playing just a very basic pattern along with them, but I'm not conducting them 
or bringing them in or telling them, okay, now you play this part and now this part. I'm just playing the part that they assigned to me, just kind of keeping them steady. So, yeah. They're composers of the music. Absolutely. How yeah. do you get them to think like creators? What's happening in the classroom where their mind is shifted towards not just, yeah, playing what other people tell me to play, but creating something? I think it's definitely easiest. I've seen now that I've been here a couple of years, mm -hmm. kids at ISS who have been here with me for that time uh, feel the most comfortable, right? Because starting with them in kindergarten and they're creating in super tiny, simple little ways, like we talked about their pumpkin bat compositions or just pumpkin and bat words that they're putting together. It seems so natural and so easy for them to put it in a pattern and then just say what it is that when I point out to them, you're, you're creating the music that you're playing. Mm -hmm. You just made music. You're a composer. And we start talking about that. And they're like, oh yeah, of course I am. Yeah, I'm definitely a composer. Yeah, I can make up music. Um, and even giving them little opportunities starting at that age um, with me singing a question to them like, what will you be for Halloween? And them getting to sing back like, I'm gonna be a zombie dinosaur or yeah. something like yeah, that, cool. right? So it's, it's so simple. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily what we think of when we define composition, mm -hmm. but they are, they're creating their own music. And once they see themselves in that really simple uh, form of composing, they feel brave enough to take on more and more complex things, especially as they get older. So. You told me a really interesting story about your own experience uh, in creating and mm. composing music. Can you share that with uh, with us? Uh, you mean my like discomfort possibly yeah. with, uh, with that? Well, yeah, because I think yeah. it's so interesting that it's possible to be comfortable um, creating on stage, improvising on stage, and it's not always the norm in music yeah. education or education in general. For sure, for sure. So my own mom was a music teacher mm -hmm. and I started taking cello lessons when I was three and a half, right? So I and took piano lessons and played in music groups and sang in choir and everything at school. So my, my theoretical understanding of music is really strong. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always felt very confident that if someone put a piece of music in front of me, I could sight read it, I could play it pretty immediately, right? If it was given to me, if I was told what to play and how to play it, I knew everything about music notation, right? I felt really confident there. But I got to high school and jazz band and for the first time was really asked to create something for myself. And I knew my band director expected it to be easy for me or something because yeah. I played well, I could read the music yeah. and I had never felt so put on the spot ever. Yeah. Like, what do you mean? What am I supposed to play? Mm -hmm. What do you mean make something up? Like, where do I start? And just being handed sort of like a list of scales. Oh, we'll just base it on this scale and not trusting myself. And that was, that was the key. I definitely could create something awesome, mm -hmm. but I didn't have this sort of internal belief that what I was creating was worth anything or was as valuable as the music that was being handed to me already printed on the page. Mm. Yeah. It, what you've described, I think, is something that as teachers we're thinking about all the time. We are asking our students to create, to participate, mm to think of how they want to design their own lives. Right. But oftentimes, even in our own, you know, in our own work, it's like, oh, how do we, oh, we have some freedom. Oh, we should create something. Yeah. We, it's hard to see ourselves in that kind of way. And I, and I wonder what, I wonder what you do to help your students actually see themselves as creators for the first time or support them, that kind of work. It's absolutely necessary for me to have no inhibition with them whatsoever. Oh, that's cool. Right? Yeah. I, and that's hard. Mm -hmm. That can be hard as an adult. 
Um, but being really honest and real with kids and letting them know, hey, I get nervous when I get on stage too. That's that's a normal thing. What do they? Right. What do they the say most you... amazing musicians in the world get nervous yeah. when they're on stage. They feel uncomfortable. What they do? Yeah. Um, yeah. That I mean, it's freeing for them, mm -hmm. right? To know I'm that it's okay to be nervous and know that you're going to do a great job, right? That you can, you have the capacity to, to do really well, to share something important. Um, but in class, just being silly, being open to all sorts of ideas, right? Giving them every opportunity to be children, mm -hmm. uh, to be creative in the way that really makes sense for them. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know what more I can say about that. So I, I'm super inspired, and mm. I would want to know some ways that I can help my students think of themselves as creators or authors or whatever. Could you give some advice to some other teachers who would like to engage in this kind of work? Um, that it's, it doesn't have to be complicated, mm. right? And that it's okay to fail and to acknowledge even to your students when something isn't working because the first, I don't know how many lessons I tried to do with kids where I was trying to lead them through like choreographing their own dance or composing their own piece of music. I was stuck with the same sorts of questions of like, oh yeah, this is so awesome. I want to have kids compose their own music, but how do I do that without just saying, okay, make something up? Mm -hmm. What is the scaffolding I need to have in place? What are the skills for, for me and music, right? What are the musical skills or concepts that they do need to know to have the basic structures mm -hmm. to be able to create their own things? Mm -hmm. And then if they want to create something that requires more than I thought I was really prepared to teach them, if they're second graders and they're really interested in trying to do something with a much too complex rhythm, being okay with that, right? Um, because organic learning like that, learning that comes about because they're fascinated, they're interested, they want to know is so much more real and lasting than just sticking straight to the curriculum anyway. So, Lacey. I really want to say thanks so much for your time, for your insights, and for sharing your work with uh, creativity. Yeah. Stop by the music room anytime. <laughs> thanks again. Yeah.